Let us pray and get into a Bible study. I think it's going to be an eye-opening Bible study for most believers and non-believers. Father, thank you for this time. Bless our Bible studies. We get into the Word of God. Give us understanding. Quicken our minds through your Spirit to give us insight and understanding. And as always, help me as a teacher to make things understandable. Make them easy for all of us to grasp. And, and with that, to encourage us in our faith, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get into it. The title of this week's Bible study is, What is an Apostle? <clears throat> And you have it in your notes. The word apostle comes from the Greek word apostello. It means a messenger or someone who's sent on a mission. It also means someone who's commissioned to represent another. In this case, the apostles were sent on a mission to represent Jesus Christ. That's what the, the original 12 apostles were sent to do. The word disciple, however, on the other hand, means learner or a pupil. And you may recall that Jesus picks his apostles from among his early disciples. Now, here's a little bit of a tricky question, if you will. How many apostles were there? Well, the, the normal, typical answer is 12. 12 apostles. Let me put that up here. And that's because of the following passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. And it reads, These are the names of the twelve apostles, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. In your notes, I have listed those twelve again. Now, you may recall, however, of the 12, Judas betrayed Jesus. So now we have minus one because Judas Iscariot kills himself. So what they, the early apostles did, I've got it in your notes. I'd like to read that if I may, uh, this passage of Scripture. Let me get, so I get this to go over here. Thank you. <coughs> Okay. In those days, Peter stood up in the middle of the disciples, and the number of the names was about 120. Those are the early disciples. And he said it was necessary that the scriptures should be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who took Jesus. Remember, Ju Judas, on the night Jesus betrayed, he actually leads his captors to him at Gethsemane in the garden. For he was counted with us and received his portion in this ministry. Now this man obtained a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, his body burst open and all of his intestines gush, gushed out. It's believed that Judas committed suicide. He took the 30 pieces of silver that they gave him to betray Jesus and he had a moment of conscience and he went back to the priest. And he wanted to give the money back, and they refused. So they took the money and bought a field with it. Anyway, he commits suicide. <clears throat> the field became known to everyone who lived in Jerusalem. That was in their language, the field that was called a caldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, quote, let his habitation be made desolate. Let no one dwell therein, and let another take his office. Of the men, therefore, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, to the day that he was received up from us, of these one must become a witness with us of his resurrection. They put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias, they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all men. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas fell away, that he might go into his own place. They drew lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was counted among the eleven apostles. So now we lost Judas, but we gained who? We gained Matthias. So we're back to... 
the original 12. And that's where we were for quite a while. But it's interesting it doesn't stop there. Although Matthias was technically the 13th apostle replacing Judas, there were to be others. For instance, and I have it again in your notes, Barnabas was considered an apostle, Acts 14, 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, notice what it reads there, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. So now we know Barnabas is one of the apostles. And then we have in Romans 16, 7, Andronicus and Junior. It says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and fellow prisoners, who are notable among the apostles, who were with also, uh, who were also in Christ before me. So Paul <coughs> is writing to greet Andronicus and Junius, and he says, "My relatives and fellow prisoners." So these two people somehow uh, were imprisoned with Paul, and then Paul says, "Even they came to faith before he did, who were also in Christ before me." So now we have two more apostles. And then in 2 Corinthians 8.23, we learn that Titus and an unnamed companion are also listed as apostles. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for you. As for our brothers, they are the apostles of the assemblies, the glory of Christ. And then we have Epaphroditus, who was also considered an apostle. It reads, your true apostle and servant of my need. And of course, we have James, the brother of the Lord, Galatians 1, 11 through 19, and probably the most prominent apostle, and that would be the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament, and the apostle Paul is the chief figure in the book of Acts, written by his companion, Luke. And if there's any uh, apostle that's well-known, it would be Paul, whose first name, biblical name actually, is Saul. He becomes known as Paul in the writings of Luke. But his real name was Saul. And no, God didn't change it, by the way. <clears throat> Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. Just a brief history of Paul, or Saul. Saul was a very rabid Pharisee of the Jews. And he had letters. He was sent out to capture Christians and bring them for trial, if you will, to have them punished. Uh, he was really hot on their trail. And as he's going to Damascus, Syria, this bright light overtakes him. And he's just, he becomes blind. And it speaks to him. It says, Saul, Saul, why kick among the pricks? In other words, why, what are you doing? And it's Jesus speaking to Saul. Anyway, he finds his way to a man's house, and there he must have learned the gospel. Then and then other places he met with Jesus somehow, and Jesus taught him. But his sight is restored, and he becomes now an avid preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. He's just as avid and committed to this new uh, commission, if you will, than he was when he was persecuting the Christians. Paul was challenged, though, about his apostleship from time to time. And here was his response in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Aren't you my work in the Lord? If no others, I am not an apostle, yet at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Excuse me. Paul's apostleship may have been questioned as he was not among the original 12, remember? And he wasn't one of the two that they were casting lots for, so it fell to Matthias. But James comes to his defense of his apostleship. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it's quite lengthy. But James, the, the brother of the Lord, becomes one of his defenders. So now we know... By my count, I have, I think, 21 apostles that we have noted. Not 12, 21. Is that all? Well, we'll see. <clears throat> Note, by the way, the one identifying 
thing about Barnabas, Andronicus, Junia, those are all identified by Paul. That, that's significant because Paul would not have identified anyone as an apostle if he didn't firmly believe, wasn't fully convinced that those people were apostles when he identifies them as such. <clears throat> well, what about today? There's always been a lingering question because some evangelical churches believe all the gifts and uh, ministries, uh, I should say the gifts are passed, uh, died out with the uh, early apostles and that we don't have apostles today. But the scriptures don't teach that. Let me read something to you in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 36. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. God has set some of the assembly, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Let's stop for a moment. We know we have teachers today, don't we? Yes. Then we must have apostles and prophets. We can't have gotten uh, rid of the apostles and prophets, but kept the teachers. Miracle workers, then gifts of healings, helps, governments. We have governments today. We have helps. If that's true, then the gift of healing is still available. In various kinds of languages or, or tongues. Are all apostles? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, not all are apostles. Are all prophets? No. Teachers? No. Miracle workers? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with various languages? Do all interpret? But then he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Moreover, I show unto you a more excellent way. What Paul is pointing out here is that the apostles, there are apostles today that are commissioned and sent out to represent. <clears throat> Unfortunately, some of them, in my opinion, have uh, some men have represented themselves as an apostle who are not. You have to know them by their work, their labor. If you've got someone out there who's simply after your money, constantly after your money, asking you to send them donations, sending you uh, miraculous pieces of cloth or holy water or anointed oil or whatever, uh, stay away from them. That's, that's nonsense. Jesus didn't engage in any of that stuff. That's just pure nonsense. It's a, it, it turned, they've turned Christianity into a business, a multi-billion dollar business. Meanwhile, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes wanting in many places in the world. It, it's just, it, it bothers me tremendously. Well, let's go to our next question. We now know we have about 21 apostles. Uh, in addition to the first 12, we have about another nine apostles. But here's the question of the day. Were any apostles female? This is the big question. And we're going to answer it today out of the scriptures, not out of my head. I'm not going to make anything up. We're going to let the scriptures tell us yes or no. Were any of the apostles female? <clears throat> let me read your notes. We know there were many apostles sent out to spread the gospel. The question, though, is were any of the apostles women? Quote, unquote. Well, there's no specific mention of an apostle by gender. We do find one apostle who was a woman, and her name was Junia, Romans 16. I want to put this up on the board. Follow this. This is very important to find out what some of the church fathers did to disguise this. Her name is found in Romans 16, and it's Junia, J-U-N-I-A. Important that you make a note of that. <coughs> I'm going to read the passage, 16, Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and fellow prisoners who are notable among the apostles who are also in Christ before me, end quote. There are two reasons why you probably haven't heard about Junia. One, she's only mentioned once in Scripture, here, Romans 16, 7. And second, some church leaders later in our history tried to disguise her identity, her gender. She's clearly a female, a woman. They tried to disguise that 
through a subtle but significant change in her name. I'm going to show that to you. Around the 13th century, in the 1200s, someone added an S to the word Junia. And in doing that, they made it appear that this was a male. Because Junia, we'll learn, is clearly female. There's no dispute about this. I'll prove it. But when they add the S, they attempted to make it appear it was Andronicus and Junius, two men, rather than a man, Andronicus, and a woman, Junia. Now, Andronicus and Junia may have been married. They may have just been friends. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But this was one of the subtle things they attempted to do in an attempt to disguise Junia's true gender. And yes, she was an apostle. <clears throat> the name Junius, and this is in your notes. I want you to look at it. <clears throat> I don't I think this is in your notes. I'm on seven. No, it's back here. The name Junius was created out of thin air. Man-made. James Walters notes, quote, researchers have been unable to locate a single example of the male name Junius in ancient literature or inscriptions, either in Latin or Greek, end quote. R.S. Servan states that, quote, Junius is not found on any inscription, public monument, graffito, or in any literary document, end quote. This name, Junius, with the S, does not appear in any ancient literature, subscriptions, monuments, nothing. It was simply made up, and the earliest we know of is around the 13th century. I believe it was an attempt to disguise the fact that one of the early apostles was a woman. <clears throat> They're trying to disguise her gender. Uh, gender bias, I'll use that term if you will, uh, is not something new to our society. It has existed throughout recorded history, but not in the scriptures. Jesus Christ especially, if, in my opinion, was a champion of women and their equality. Now, when I say that, some people think they're thinking wrong. I didn't say we're the same. We're equal in the eyes of God. We, we have different roles. I'm contemplating doing another Bible study next week on uh, equal pay. <laughs> this is this will blow your mind. We fill different roles, but we're equal before God. There's neither male nor female, bond nor free. Jew nor Gentile in Christ. We're all one. We're all one. Anyway, continuing. Theologian Scott McKnight, an American New Testament scholar, tells us what happened in their attempt to disguise Junia, true gender. And I, I'm quoting now. <clears throat> Junia was a woman, and she was an apostle. But since a woman couldn't be an apostle... Junia became the male Junius. There is no evidence in ancient manuscripts that anyone understood Junia as a male. No evidence in translations that she was a male. There's no ancient evidence that Junius was a man's name. But still the church got into a rut and wrote it out until some courageous folks said, quote, oh yes, Junia was a woman and she was an apostle, and we've been wrong, and we're going to do something about it. <laughs> I found it really remarkable, to their credit, the early church fathers, virtually all of them, recognized that Junia was a woman. It was around the 13th century where the bias began to really creep in, and the attacks began, the attempt to change the scripture. But up until that point, we read and we discover in history that most believed, most early church fathers acknowledged Junia was a woman. However, that doesn't settle the question, the argument. But let's look. 
origin of Alexandria, A.D. 185 to 254. So he would have been just a hundred years or so after the apostles, the early apostles. He was a theologian and biblical commentator. He understood the name to be feminine, Junia or Julia. John Chrysostom, 347 to 407 A.D., Bishop of Constantinople, wrote a series of homilies that have been preserved. In commenting on Romans 16.7, he praised Junia as an outstanding apostle. And they believe she was, Junia was a woman. Continuing, Leonard Swindler writes, quote, to the best of my knowledge, no commentator on the text, he's referring to Romans 16.7, until Aegidus of Rome, 1245 to 1316, so 13th century, took the name to be masculine. Aegidus simply referred to the two persons in Romans 16.7 as those honorable men without any explanation. He just made it up out of thin air, changed it from Junia to Junius, and then translated 16.7, Romans 16.7, as those honorable men. That's it. Well, unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of Bible translators took it into account and changed the scriptures, unfortunately. However, for centuries they knew the name Junior was clearly referring to a woman. For centuries, I have a couple of notes here, it's not in your notes. Douglas Moo, a Reformed New Testament scholar, wrote, quote, agrees that commentators before the 13th century were unanimous in favor of a female rendering, end quote. They attempted to mask the fact by adding the S and making the name Junius, which they claimed was male, though there was no ancient textual archaeological support for Junius being a male name. It didn't actually exist at all before the 13th century. They can't find it. Despite the overwhelming evidence, some Bible translations still to this day use Junius instead of Junia. The American Standard Version reads, Salute Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Andronicus and Junius, American Standard Version. Here we have the literal translation of the Holy Bible. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen. And then the revised version, salute Andronicus and Junius. There it is again, that error, false name. It, I don't know how they could put that in the scripture when the name, the word didn't even exist. They can't find it anywhere in ancient literature, inscriptions, archaeological findings, the artifacts. They can't find it. It doesn't exist. However, the overwhelming majority of Bibles today Use Junia. And that refers to a woman, <clears throat> a female apostle. Can you imagine that? Wow. Well, what about her position as an apostle? <clears throat> this is important. Among those who agreed the name should be Junia, feminine, female, and not Junius, male. Some have attempted to discredit Junia as a true apostle by mistranslating the phrase notable among the apostles. I told you the assault didn't stop. Even though they agreed the name was female, then they begin to quibble with these words. Notable among the apostles. Andronica and Junia were notable among the apostles. Well, does that, does that mean that Junia, Andronicus and Junia were apostles? Or does it simply mean that they were known by the apostles? That's the question. Among those who agreed the name should be Junia, female, not Junia, some attempted to discredit Junia as a true apostle by mistranslating the phrase notable among the apostles. 
Instead of using notable among the apostles, some translations use regarded by or known to. So they weren't notable. They were regarded by or known to. But they weren't apostles. You see where this is going? So they gave a little ground on the fact that Junia is a woman. They know she's a woman. They acknowledge she's a woman. We know uh, historically that the name Junius didn't even exist before the 13th century. So now the new attack, though subtle, is, well, the Greek translation of notable among the apostles simply means they were regarded by them or they were known by the apostles. But it doesn't mean that Junia was an apostle. Well, <coughs> this is what it says. The words, the Greek, I'm going to try my best Greek now. Epis omoi in toi apostolis, notable among the apostles, would translate as outstanding among the apostles. That's the standard New Testament lexicon. Other lexicons rendered the phrase as, quote, pertaining to being well-known or outstanding. Quote, they are outstanding among the apostles. That's what they believe it means. I have in your notes, the Brill Dictionary of Ancient Greek defines episimos as marked, distinguished, bearing a mark, and therefore distinguished, distinct, notable. In other words, Andronicus and Junia bore the mark of an apostle. I find that interesting. J.B. Lightfoot agrees with that the natural way to translate episomoi in toi apostolis is, quote, regarded as apostles. You following me? Making any sense? <coughs> There are so many sources that I could have quoted to show that uh, regarded among the apostles meant they were apostles. I simply didn't want to belabor the point uh, to an extreme. But let it be known that the overwhelming evidence supports a number of things. One, Junia is a female name. Two, Junius, when you add the S, that word so-called male name, did not exist until the 13th century. And it was added to, to try and change Junior's gender from a female apostle to a male. And then again, notable among the apostles, clearly the overwhelming number of scholars, Greek scholars, agree. It indicates, it proves, it supports the belief that Junia and Andronicus were both apostles. They'd been in prison with Paul. They came to faith before Paul. They were fellow laborers with Paul. Junia, a woman, was an early apostle. Beyond dispute. We have, we have churches today, they don't get, they don't understand the equality of men and women in ministry. And this is still a struggle. A lot of evangelical churches prohibit women from being elders, pastors. Uh, I know one church that we attended recently, uh, the, the pastor's wife does the Sunday morning Bible study before the service. <clears throat> and I've attended it many times. But I noticed there are only a couple of men in the audience. And one day when I was with the pastor, I asked him about that. And, and his wife, by the way, she was there. And they both commented that the, their men in the church don't believe a woman can teach a man. And so they stay away when she's teaching. They, well, well, she's a fairly ad, uh, adept teacher. I've sat under her teaching a number of times. But it's because of this evangelical bias, if you will, against women. If a woman could be an apostle, a woman could teach a man. They were commissioned to go out and teach about Jesus. That was their job. What was she, half an apostle? You know, one third of an apostle? She could be an apostle except she couldn't do this. 
<clears throat> I don't think so. But let's look at the scriptures. Let's look at the early church history here. We know Phoebe was a deaconess in Romans 16, 1. That meant that they actually served in the church. That was the whole point of it. They were deacons and deaconesses. In the Brotherhood Church, we had deacons and deaconesses. They both served. Priscilla and Aquila were co-workers with Paul and risked their lives for the gospel. Well, that's interesting. What's really interesting is that Priscilla and Aquila also taught Apollo more perfectly in the gospel, a male. So here we see a husband-wife team teaching a man. But it doesn't say just Aquila. It says Priscilla and Aquila taught him more perfectly. How could she teach him more perfectly? Obviously, she knew more than he did. That seems to me to be rather obvious. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it, Beyond dispute. And by the way, Apollos, it says in Acts 18, 26, though he was already an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, Priscilla and Aquila had something more to add to him. Wow. That's, that's saying something. <clears throat> Tryphena and Tryphosa. Aren't you glad you're not named Tryphena and Tryphosa? Yeah. Hey, try, Tryphena. Oh, no, you're Tryphosa. I get your girls mixed up all the time. Labored in the Lord, Romans 16, 12, as did Persis, who, quote, much labored. That is, he worked. They worked. She worked especially hard in the scriptures. We know, and this, again, is a point of contention in the church today. <coughs> Women are not allowed to speak in the church, in some churches. They can't teach, they can't prophesy, they can't speak in tongues. They can worship, of course, but they're not allowed, to, for instance, to prophesy. Women are to remain silent. I, I should do that teaching. I, I don't know if there's enough interest in it. It's quite involved. But the teaching where it reads in Timothy, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor you suit the authority over man. That's one of the most misunderstood passages. If you simply read the rest of the scriptures, you readily become aware of the fact that that passage of scripture doesn't make sense in light of all the other scriptures. Because women did speak in the church. They prayed, they praised, they worshiped, they taught, they prophesied. So we've got something going on here with I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp the authority over men. I know what the answer is. I'll, I'll wait and see if there's any interest uh, well, to we, pursue that. You know, that's I quite... have a comment asking, what are your thoughts on the scriptures that say women are to remain silent in the church? Yeah, that, uh, just quickly, that's a rabbinical injunction from the Jewish law because it also goes on to say, as also saith the law. There is no law in the entire scripture that says a woman ha and has to remain silent in the church. You won't find that. But you will find it, I believe it's in the Talmud. That's off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure that's what that is. It's not an injunction. If you read the letter from Paul to the Corinthian church, he's answering questions that they're having, disputes and arguments, if you will. And that's one of them. But I'm telling you, well, let's go on. This will answer your question about remaining silent in the church. Let me, let me just continue. <clears throat> there were female prophetesses in the early church. Anna was a prophetess. And that's found in Luke 2.36. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. So we know she was a prophetess. The evangelist Philip's four daughters, quote, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed, and came on to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Acts 21, 8 and 9. Where did they prophesy? You prophesy in the church. These passages tell us that women in the early church played significant roles teaching prophesying and ministering they were not restricted due to their gender they may have been restricted due to their gifts and or abilities and calling those are fair game but not simply because someone's a woman 
versus being a man. Finally, Junior is recognized. Several Bibles at once read Ionian, which would translate into English as Junius, with the S, remember, a male, and thus translated Junius have since been revised. Remember, Bible commentators prior to the 13th century unanimously favored the female Junia. Despite the attempts to diminish Junia's actual position as an apostle, an overwhelming majority of Bible translations from the late 1300s to the 1800s translated her name Ionian as a woman, not as a man. And since 2000, there have been at least 30 new translations or revisions that translate Aonian as Junia, a female apostle. I conclude the following thoughts. Quote, according to scripture, Junia was a female apostle. The evidence is authoritative, compelling, diverse, and objective. The testimony of early manuscripts, statements of various church leaders through the 12th century, lexical definitions, grammatical construction, scriptural examples, consistency of Bible translations from the 1300s onward, and extensive contemporary and past scholarship of all provide conclusive evidence that Junia was a female apostle, end quote. And I give you the citation. Now, one last word. It took me 20 years of ministry to receive this and to understand it. For 20 years, we did not allow women to be elders in our church. Therefore, they couldn't be pastors. They had other freedoms, but that was the one restriction. And that changed at my 20th year. And what caused it to change, I came into a new understanding of the passage, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp the authority over a man. That passage of scripture on its face seems to restrict women. But a deeper study of that passage reveals it did not, it was not intended to restrict women from teaching men. It was intended to restrict women from teaching that Eve was first created and that what Eve did was a good thing in eating from the forbidden tree of knowledge. And those are Gnostic concepts. And there's much more. Gnosticism had already crept into the early church. For instance, John, the Apostle John writes about it. If anyone denies that Christ came in, in, the, in the flesh, well, he's referring to a Gnostic belief. If he came in the flesh, you couldn't be, be of God because God is only spirit. And then the other part where it talks about forbidding of marrying. That's a Gnostic teaching because when you have children, you disperse more of God. Yes, that's a Gnostic teaching. The early church was heavily influenced, I should say, uh, they tried to influence the early church through Gnostic teachings. When Paul's writing, I suffer not a woman, he's dealing with one of those Gnostic teachings. In fact, the fundamental one, that Eve was first. And she brought us wisdom by eating the forbidden uh, fruit. And Adam came in second, you know, it was Eve. If you reread that passage in its entirety, you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll pick up on it. Anyway. If you're interested, and that's a, that's a really in-depth teaching, but if people are interested, let me know. Uh, and if you have any other topics, let me know, and we will deal with them. But clearly, women are not restricted in the New Testament simply because of gender. Number two, remember, Andronicus and Junia. Junia was a female, and they were uh, noted among the apostles. She was an apostle. We now get that, and the vast majority support that. With that in mind, God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Well, Lord, this was a controversial one, but I hope people that are stirred by it, if they're unconvinced for any reason, have them go to work and study it, and they'll find what I discovered. Junia was a woman, and Junia was noted notable among the apostles. She was an apostle. It's, a, it's beyond dispute in my mind. Father, help us to understand our equality and at the same time our differentness, if you will. We're not the same men and women, but before God, we're equals. 
fact, we know there are some women that far outshine men in intelligence and skills and abilities and so forth. It's not gender, it's God. We're all made in the image and likeness of God. And Christ died for all of us equally. Women don't come in second, that's for sure. Father, bless this teaching, I pray, to the hearts and minds of many, many people, men and women, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.